performed on AROS uh, a few months ago. Um, yep. So, in some of the goals of our project is we heard that Amiga OS 4 was getting uh, SP support. We thought, how hard could it possibly be? So, we decided to see how hard it could possibly be. So, uh, we set this out as a uh, experiment and intentionally gave it a silly name so people wouldn't be expecting um, full run production code in a month. So the goal of our project was to determine the complexity of adding SMP support to EROS and we completed that. It was a relatively low impact outside of exec. A couple of program changes were needed but not much throughout the operating system. Implement uh, SMP on Eris hosted on Linux. That was our basic test bench because we wouldn't have to worry about starting up additional CPUs and we could use the pthread library as a simulator of SMP support. Uh, also, we wanted to implement SMP on real hardware, specifically the x86-64 branch of Eros. And that's currently in progress and needs a lot of debugging. And finally, we wanted to determine the impact on applications of SMP support. Uh, currently, most of that is only theoretical. We need a reliable OS base first before we can really delve into that. So lots of work left to do. And uh, due to reasons I'll be explaining later, we may need to experiment with scheduler rules to try to get uh, um, a majority of applications to work with SMP support. So the first experiment we did was doing SMP on Eris hosted on Linux. This was my initial prototype and we developed it over the course of about four weeks. And that demonstrated that SMP support would have minimal impact on well-written apps and on libraries. And that SMP support is hard without spin locks. The semantics of the forbid and disable operating systems primitives are extremely complex and slow to implement on an SMP system. Just because of the way that uh, Amiga OS applications ever since 1.3 have expected those functions to behave and their side effects. Also, we discovered that a few applications re rely on add task priority quirks, where, for example, if you were running at priority zero and you created a new task of priority 10, that new task would immediately start running. And your task that you started the, the second task from would not run again until that first task had either completed or blocked. So the SMP on x86-64 was developed by Michael Schultz and he's extended the previous x86-64 implementation so that it now handles full SMP boot using APIC, IPI, ACPI, all the acronyms of the x86 world. And it can start multiple CPUs in SMP mode. We have still like tons of work left to do on this, mostly because he's waiting for me to finish the baseline SMP support on EROS uh, hosted. And of course, debug, 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 like any experiment. So when we were developing this experiment, one of the bits of research that I did was to consider how other operating systems move to SMP. Now, for example, QNX is a lot like AmigaOS in the way a scheduler operates. It's an exclusive priority scheduler, meaning that the highest priority task that is capable of running is the only task that is running. Uh, whenever QNX migrated to a micro uh, to SMP, the way they retained those characteristics was that only one task at a time can use the microcurrent. So this has no real analog to AmigaOS, where effectively all tasks are running in kind of a kernel space at the same time. Low priority tasks on QNX could run in parallel, but higher priority tasks uh, were set to be run exclusively from each other. Uh, 
this is a lesson that we may be able to use whenever we're implementing the uh, scheduler in the silly S and P. Also, QNX needed to use spin locks instead of IRQ disables. This mapped almost directly to our issues with disable and forbid. The Windows 95 family, uh, by contrast, basically just kicked their entire kernel out the door and used the Windows in T kernel. So that's how they handled SMP was to design it in from the start. Linux had a different path. Uh, all tasks needed to enter the kernel to do almost anything. So they had a single point where they could implement a big kernel lock. That got, that got them SMP relatively quickly, but only, again, like QNX, only one CPU in the kernel at a time. Over the years, however, Linux has moved to using um, primitives such as spin locks, um, RCU, mutexes, and other concepts in the kernel to allow multiple concurrent CPUs in the kernel. Linux didn't have any of the scheduling issues that Amigos and QNX did because it has a non-exclusive priority scheduler. So, again, to recap for Amigos, there are some good things. Now, the Amigos family libraries and programs are designed to be able to handle re-entrancy. Libraries can handle multiple callers simultaneously from different tasks without any problems. And the Miros family has always been a true multitasking operating system. Since it is most similar to QNX in the way its scheduler and priority systems work, we can take the QNX SMP model as a reference of how one operating system migrated from single processor to SMP and we can try to learn from their lessons. There are unfortunately several bad things about Amigos. Since there was never any real um, kernel to user uh, interface and everybody could poke into whatever memory location they wanted, that led to several poor design decisions with user visible APIs. Uh, for example, file system resource requires a forbid around any time that you access it. Um, graphics based default font, uh, DOS lists, there are literally tens to maybe hundreds of elements in the Amiga OS kernel that will require uh, careful attention if we want to update those APIs to be able to support SMP without requiring an expensive forbid and disable. Um, many programs we found use forbid and permit instead of a signaling semaphore as kind of a quick and dirty uh, locking mechanism. And those should be changed to use the faster signal semaphore of the S&P support. Also, we found a number of assumptions about ad task priority and blocking, as I mentioned before. So to prepare for SMP, and um, whenever I was listening to Steve Soley's presentation about the X kernel, I found it very enlightening that we both follow some of the same uh, decision paths. Um, task status is now per CPU, so it's no longer accessible via the exec base pointer. Um, in a similar way, the sys flags, attention reschedule flags, which were used to force the scheduler to perform uh, global operations are now only via, are not accessible via the exec base point, are now strictly internal to exec. And finally, this one impacts a number of debug utilities and some programs that didn't feel the need to call find task instead of just instead of getting exec based disk task. The task management pointers, this task, task weight, and task ready are no longer visible or will no longer be visible in exec base. The current implementation has them visible, but uh, we currently believe that they will probably need to be moved into a per CPU list. Now, Eros differs from the other EOS families and that we have an underlying HAL hardware abstraction layer uh, called kernel.resource. 
and we had to implement five new APIs in the kernel.resource to be able to handle the basic concepts of S&P. These are get CPU count, which gets the total number of CPUs from the underlying hardware, get the current CPU number, which is a unique identifier for this CPU, three point of the uh, other sets, the intervals, basically where we get their first task from and set CPU storage and get CPU storage, where we can have a per CPU pointer that points to the scheduling information for that specific CPU. That's where those uh, lists and status entries that I mentioned on the previous slide live now, is in that per CPU storage area. And uh, let's talk about forbid and disable. Disable under Amiga OS is a routine that stops all interrupt activity and all task switching until the corresponding enable is called later. Um, this, as I said, causes all interrupts to stop. Nothing else can happen other than whatever this task is doing. No task switching may occur. And in an SMP context, following this must stop all work on all other CPUs. So originally, this was expected to be a fast operation. Under x86, it was a single instruction call, CLI. Under M68K, it was a single write to a single uh, hardware register. But on SMP, this isn't a, a cheap operation at all. You have to uh, coordinate with the other CPUs to stop their processing, to prevent the other CPUs from being stopped in a way that would be um, where we could have deadlocks in exec. It's not a cheap operation. Forbid is kind of a lighter weight version of disable. It stops task switching, but doesn't stop interrupts. So in forbid state, you will never, you won't switch to another task unless an interrupt is called and a signal is called from that interrupt and a higher priority task gets context. So semantics of forbid are difficult to implement in this method because that new uh, task could be on any CPU. So again, in forbid, no task switching may occur unless we get an interrupt. We must again stop work on other CPUs and the uh, forbid context can be broken by any number of OS calls like signal or wage and the forbid context of having the other CPU stopped must be restored whenever control returns to this task. So again, something that was cheap to implement in a unit processor that now becomes an expensive, terrible uh, uh, function to use in user space on an S&P system. So, is there a question? Right. All right, everything's kind of garbled. Whoever needs to talk needs to come up front. All right, you need to get closer. <laughs> oh, good, good. Thank you. All right, so forbid and uh, disable and forbid, we need to clean them up. And the biggest consumer of the disable and forbid calls is itself exec. So forbid and disable ruins performance on S&P, and they both go from cheap to expensive. We need to eliminate disable and forbid in exec library. And over 60 functions in exec use disable and forbid in their internals. And we can't replace them with signal and semaphores directly because signal semaphores rely on signal and wait, which again, rely on disable. So we get kind of into a catch-22 if we just try to implement it that way. So what to do? And now we're going to look to QNX for an answer. We're going to use spinlocks. Oliver Brunner has added spinlock support to the prototype. They are currently an internal primitive only used in exec. They uh, wait until unlocked without calling for a bid. All they do is lower the task priority to negative 128 and just 
sit there waiting on us, uh, reading the lock over and over again until that lock is back at um, normal priority, uh, unlocked. And once that is unlocked, it raises its priority to a normal priority and executes the locked section. Only the holding task can unlock the spin. So we, uh, just like any other type of spin lock implementation. This will allow us to implement locking in exec without using forbid and disable. Stable semaphore can now use spin locks. And um, although many more exec APIs need to be converted to use this new spin lock mechanism. Now, uh, one of the beauties of this is that spin lock will be also usable on the uniprocessor support with hopefully very little impact. But again, we're going to have to do experiments and determine what the cost of using spin locks on the regular uh, unit processor and see what those costs are. So we've done a little bit of um, theoretical application impact. Uh, most well-written errors applications should be OK, so long as you're not directly referencing the uh, forbidden elements out of exec base, you should be fine. Um, most of the ARIS programs shouldn't even require a recompile. Um, there are, of course, exceptions. You need to watch out for programs that are called disable and forbid. Uh, we're going to make sure that those work as expected in the final version, but they will be expensive operations. So if at all possible, you should start using um, signal semaphore or other locking mechanisms instead of uh, the same or forbid where possible. Uh, applications that assume, in, assume that add task of a higher priority task blocks the calling task, um, those need to be checked out. That happens a number of times in multimedia programs. Assuming that add task of something with a priority less than self will not run until we ourselves block, that also needs to be checked. Um, that happens mostly in tasks that are trying to install some sort of uh, low-level cleanup utility, like a memory defragmenter. Those need to be checked to make sure that the task that's going to be added is completely ready to run before add task is called. Um, there's a number of terrible old APIs that require forbidden disable, like DOS, list, graphics based changes. We're probably going to have to consider adding new APIs to uh, handle properly locking those. And again, directly reading this task and some other elements from exec base need to be watched out for. Now, this, the, this task, uh, I'll speak a moment, a number of those uh, bad things to read from exec base. There are some games we can play around with the MMU to be able to catch those, treat them as exceptions, and present the right information transparently to the older application. Uh, but again, that waits for later once the groundwork has been laid and we've, we're are happy with the functionality of the baseline S&P support. Uh, we've got some open scheduler concerns. Um, add to task and blocking. How often is this really an issue? How many programs does it impact? If it impacts a lot, maybe we could uh, try doing the QNX um, solution in kind of a way. Is if we can assign any CPU if the new, um, new task priority is the same as ours, or stay on this CPU if the priority is different. So for example, in that task cleanup example, the uh, new task would stay on the same CPU, so it would not be preempted until the calling task is done. Some other questions we have, do error handlers block all CPUs or just the tasks on CPU 0? Currently it's just CPU 0, but maybe they should block all CPUs. We need to consider that. And when should tasks migrate between CPUs, the so-called CPU affinity? Current implementation is that tasks never migrate between CPUs. Um, we need to look into that because there are certain scenarios where we could get a bunch of 
tasks created on both CPU 1 and CPU 2. And over the course of time, all the tasks on CPU 2 exit. And now CPU 2 is completely free to run tasks, but none are scheduled to it. This will probably need to be addressed later, but for now we're assuming that the start CPU is your CPU forever. So where is this code? Um, you can learn from uh, this Gatorius branch, and this uh, presentation will be sent to, has been sent to uh, Mr. Borzi and um, will be available hopefully to any Amy West attendees, and I'll make it generally available after Amy West ends. Um, we have three branches. We've got Silly SNP, which is the errors hosted on Linux, XA664 SNP, which is the X86, X86 64 port, and um, Oliver Brunner has his own branch where he's doing some research on spin locks. Um, unfortunately, over the past two months, only Oliver Brunner has been active lately. I've been on you know, kind of a release day death march at work. Where I work at an ASIC company, and we've got an ASIC coming out soon, so I'm a little bit busy with that. I have not been able to dedicate as much time as I would like to Eros, but after the Christmas holidays, I should be able to have some free time to continue this research. And, and unfortunately, I'm blocking Michael Schultz. He's kind of eagerly chomping at the bit for my completed work, so hopefully I can get something to him as soon as, I can, as, soon as possible. And uh, where's the demo, you ask? Nope, none for you. This is an experimental research project. No demos. Uh, not ready for prime time. Not going to give a demo. If you want to run it, download the code, help us debug, and you can give yourself your own demo. Maybe for Amy West 2014, I'll be able to show something in interesting. But for now, this is primarily a research project. Um, still very buggy. It boots maybe one time out of 10. And we need to work on improved spin lock integration. Lots of work to do, but I should see it has promise. Um, it was not the the doom and despair that a lot of people claimed would happen whenever S and P was attempted on AmigaOS. Yeah, there were some issues, but I think they can be worked around. And as uh, AmigaOS 4's X kernel is showing, I think that. Uh, the same ger general principles are applicable to the entire Amigos family of similar operating systems. So, in that vein, uh, what does this mean for Eris? Uh, Eris needs at least six months or a year to get silly S&P into a releasable uh, form. And I really want to demo that for Amy West 2014 on at least two or three architectures. Hopefully, PPC SP. Uh, if someone wants to run me at X1000, I would be more than happy to port it to it. So, Amigos 4, Morphos, um, silly SP concepts can be easily applied there. Uh, today was the first day I heard about the X kernel, and I applaud Amigos for going in almost the same direction that Eros silly SP is. Um, I see a lot of uh, commonality there, and and maybe we can. There we are, screen sharing. Yay! All right, let me start the presentation again. Um, was this approximately where I left off? Uh, like uh, I heard a couple of laughs from the words of the demo thing. So, all right. So yeah, okay. So, Amigos, uh, Eris. Hopefully, we'll have a demo by 2014. If someone would loan me loan us a uh, SNP PowerPC machine, we could probably develop an imp implementation for that too. Uh, Amigos 4 and Morphos. Uh, we would love to share our experiences with those teams, and if there's any uh, commonalities between the operating systems, that would be fantastic. Uh, contact me, or if you don't want to, just look at the sources. And 
Eris 3, uh, Migos 3, M68K. If someone can find me an S&P M68K machine, I would be more than happy to port uh, our S&P stuff to it. So to wrap up, thank you for your interest. Um, you can contact us at www.eris.org. And um, these are our email addresses of the primary developers on the Silly S&P project. And, and um, we're, I'll be releasing this presentation for general release, probably on the ARIS website, uh, after Annie West is concluded. So at this time, if there's any questions, uh, come up to the mic and uh, give, me a, give me a question. <laughs> yes, that is the bane of thorough presentation. All right, you're welcome. And we tried to put the research back into Eris Research Operating System. <laughs> uh, I'm going to definitely try to make it out next year. Uh, the only reason I was, wasn't able to make it this year was due to uh, a, just an overloaded work schedule. Mm -hmm. uh, does it have a uh, dual core CPU? Yes. <laughs> yep. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, if. Uh, the X1000 has a dual core system, and I feel it's a shame that uh, at this time, Linux is the only released operating system that has support for both of the cores. Yep. Uh, in an ideal world, uh, we could do Eris hosted on the PowerPC Linux to be able to experiment with uh, getting PowerPC uh, S&P support implemented using Eris hosted, and then eventually Put that to Eris running native on the X1000. I'll even answer general Eris questions or M60AK ones. All right. All right. Bye bye. Enjoy my Windows desktop. All right. Have a good Emmy West.